Trash Vortex, Chapter 2. Shaping a Modern Life. Charles Moore discovered an unusual rock on Hawaii's Camillo Beach in 2006. When Canadian geologist Patricia Corcoran heard about it, she flew out to see it. The lump contained shells, coral, wood, and volcanic rock and sand, all fused together by great heat and plastic. She named it Plastiglomerate and determined that it had been created by bonfires built by campers on the trash-strewn beach. Corcoran inspected the beach's larger plastic trash, trash and found it had traveled from Russia and Asia, riding a gyre's currents. Colorful microplastics mixed with grains of beach sand. How did they get to this Hawaiian beach so far from the open sea? Oceanographer Chris Ebsmeyer once described how the gyre's polluted center moves around like a big animal without a leash. When it gets close to an island, the garbage patch barfs, and you get a beach covered with this confetti of plastic. Henderson Island in the South Pacific Ocean, for example, is remote and uninhabited, yet littered with 38 million pieces of plastic. Like a chunk of plastiglomerate, Today's beach sand holds history. Every little piece of plastic manufactured in the past 50 years that made it into the ocean is still out there somewhere because there was no effective mechanism to break it down, said plastics researcher Anthony Andretti. Sea glass and bits of ceramic and rusted metal also mix with beach sand to tell an older story. People have always been searching for the best materials to shape into the necessities and luxuries of everyday living. They learned to mold clay, hammer metal, and melt glass into sand. So here's a picture of beaches littered with plastic and other types of trash are found around the world. They shaved thin sheets of animal horns to make translucent panes for lanterns. These materials are plastic in the sense that they can be easily shaped. The English word plastic comes from the Greek word plastikos, which means moldable. Trees can make a kind of plastic with the help of human creativity. More than 2,000 years ago, the Olmecs, Mayans, and people from other Mesoamerican civilizations cut the bark of rubber trees to release drips of milky fluid. By mixing in juice from marigold vines, they made rubber elastic and useful for making bouncy balls, stretchy bands, glue, and flexible sandals. Europeans exploring the region in the 16th century were intrigued by this new material and learned how to plant, harvest, and use rubber. By 1830, people living in wet climates eagerly bought rubber-treated clothing and boots invented by Scottish chemist Charles Mackintosh. The Macintosh raincoat is named after him, but spelled differently. While rubber was waterproof, it was not weatherproof. In the winter, rubber cracked and in the summer it melted. Charles Goodyear, a self-taught American chemist, solved that problem in 1839 after years of tireless experimentation at home and possibly with the help of an accident. When a lump of rubber mixed with the eggy smelling chemical sulfur slipped from his hand onto a hot stove, he discovered a transformation. It was dry and firm, yet still flexible. The vulcanized rubber, named after Vulcan, the Roman god of fire, now takes many forms, including tires, protective casings for electronic wires, soccer balls, shoe soles, water hoses, and erasers. A, work a workable recipe for rubber did not end the search for new multi-purpose materials. Okay, and we'll just look at the um, illustration here. The successful processing of rubber in the mid-1800s led to a wide range of products. So there's a factory making rubber. The urge to solve problems and to get rich is strong, Moore pointed out. Natural materials such as tortoiseshell and animal horn once commonly used to make everyday items like combs, were scarce and expensive. Inventors raced to find ways to manufacture new materials to imitate expensive materials. In the 1860s, British chemist Alexander Parks proved that wood fibers called cellulose could help 
make more than paper. By adding ingredients such as nitric acid, he created a moldable, moldable material for making low-cost everyday items, including combs, buttons, and silverware handles. American factory owner John Wesley Hyatt improved the formula in 1870 and called the new material celluloid. By adding camphor, a waxy chemical, he created a doughy substance that dried hard. He used celluloid to make smooth white billiard balls, uh, pool like pool balls, that looked like expensive elephant ivory and eyeglasses dyed to imitate tortoiseshell. Celluloid was molded, cut, pressed, and polished to make brush handles, piano keys, eyeglass frames, false teeth, and even photographic film. In the early 1900s, Belgian-American chemist Leo Bakeland created a sticky honey-colored substance produced by Asian beetles. This natural resin coated and protected electrical wires, but it was scarce. Like other inventors, Bakeland turned to natural materials to make a synthetic version. But his raw material, petroleum, originated from ancient plants transformed by pressure and heat deep underground. Despite a laboratory fire, Bakeland experimented with mixing sharp-smelling petroleum gas and liquids derived from coal. Under pressure, okay, so th this, uh, I'm going to skip a page here because the sentence continues uh, on the next page. Under pressure and heat, the result was a thick resin easily poured into molds before it dried hard and glossy. Bakeland named his new material Bakelite and it has been called the first modern plastic. Advertised as the material of a thousand uses, it could be molded, drilled, bent, and pressed by machines to create objects of almost any shape. Customers could not get enough of the sleek, fashionable material. It was shaped into doorknobs, toothbrushes, steering wheels, radios, jewelry, pen, pens, telephones, and even coffins. Chemists were soon inventing more petroleum-based materials. Now I'm going to go back to this page, which um, is an illustration, but it has uh, some some uh, explanation of how uh, plastic developed. So this this page says, uh, decades of experiments, nature inspired people to make plastics. Natural materials such as rubber, tortoiseshell, cellulose, shellac, wool, cotton, silk, wax, and leather are flexible and durable because of how their molecules fit together. If a molecule can connect in two places to another molecule like itself, the result is called a monomer. When a monomer links with hundreds or thousands of monomers, it forms a long chain-shaped molecule called a polymer. Long polymer chains are the basis of both natural and human-made substances. Gyres hold the results of decades of experiments with petroleum-based polymers. Scientists adjusted chemicals in hydrogen and carbon chains to create plastics with useful properties. Flexible polyethylene is used to make plastic bags and water bottles. Polypropylene's polymer chains fit together and make it heat resistant uh, for food containers. Scientists added gas to the hydrocarbon chain to create polystyrene, a plastic that can resist impacts to make computer monitors, furniture, and plastic cutlery. They learned how to make thousands of items from elastic bubble gum to fishing line to skateboards. And here's an advertisement for a type of kitchen countertop using uh, the plastic for mica. All right, back to this next page. Right here. The journey from naturally occurring materials to synthetic ones begins with pumps drawing crude oil from underground. The dark liquid contains many kinds of fuels that must be separated at refineries. Propane is used for furnaces and gas barbecue, barbecue grills. Gasoline is used for automobile engines. Jet fuel pro propels planes. About 4% of crude oil contains the materials su such as naphtha that are needed to make plastics. They are heated and mixed with other chemicals to create plastics of various colors and degrees of flexibility, ranging from rigid to rubbery. The new material is extruded into long ribbons, sliced into pellets, and sent to factories. Softened by heat, the raw plastic can take countless forms. In the 1930s, factories puffed up plastic into a light foam for home insulation or stretched it into silky 
threads for nylon stockings or toothbrush bristles. Once hand polished out of tortoiseshell, combs now poured out of plastic factories at the rate of thousands a day. New plastics could take brightly colored dyes or be clear to reveal food inside. Shape changing was the superpower what was the superpower of a hero in a 1940s comic called Plastic Man. Plastics were enlisted for critical jobs in World War II. They were used to make parachutes and parts for airplanes and guns. They coated antennae, uh, antennae and radar cables and lined helmets. Factories manufactured four times as much plastic at the end. And uh, so we'll just look at this picture here. Crude oil is separated into many kinds of fuels at huge oil refineries. So that's a picture of where all of this um, plastic uh, starts its process. Factories manufactured four times as much plastic at the end of the war as they had before the war. After the war, factory owners did not want profits to slow. Plastic businesses shifted from supplying soldiers in battle to supplying civilians at home. Beginning in the 1950s, plastics trickled and then flooded into everyday life, replacing such materials as glass and expensive materials, metals and rubber. Plastic took the shapes of countertops, clear plastic wrap for food, squeeze bottles, electrical plugs, telephones, toothbrushes, and even contact lenses and clear adhesive tape. Children assembled plastic building block sets and played with dolls molded from plastic instead of fragile porcelain. One toy was simply a lump of plastic putty that playful hands could press, pull, and twist into endless shapes. Factories in the 1960s produced stackable chairs molded from a single piece of plastic. Plastics even ventured to the moon in the nylon threads of the flag planted by Neil Armstrong. Later, they traveled into the human body with the first artificial heart. Plentiful and affordable plastics helped shape a new lifestyle. They helped people of all incomes get more for their money. We were a nation of consumers now, a society increasingly democratized by our shared ability to enjoy the conveniences and comforts of modern life, wrote author Susan Frankel. Among the modern conveniences and comforts were dishwashers and air conditioners. Here's a picture from Life magazine. A photo in a 1955 Life article illustrated how the U.S. had turned into a disposable society using throwaway items. Plastics offered another convenience. A 1955 article in Life magazine titled Throwaway Living, Disposable Items Cut Down Household Chores featured a photograph of a family tossing plates, cups, napkins, and more. The objects flying through the air would take 40 hours to clean, said the caption, except no housewife need bother. They are all meant to be thrown away after use. By the 1960s, people were writing with disposable pens instead of refillable fountain pens and drinking coffee from foam cups instead of ceramic ones that required washing. Yet, Humans have always found new forms for old materials. Objects made of metal were repaired or the materials used again. Worn out clothing could be mended, redesigned, or shredded to make paper. But then it sometimes became cheaper to buy new plastic goods than repair old ones. The idea that you threw stuff out when it wore out is a 20th century idea, wrote Susan Strasser, author of Waste and Want, A Social History of Trash. Plastic trash started accumulating where trash always had, in waterways. From ancient Rome to some cities even today, foul-smelling sewage has polluted drinking water with diseases. Riverside factories have added industrial chemicals. Ohio's Cuyahoga River was so polluted with chemicals that it caught fire in 1969, catching the attention of government leaders. The Federal Clean Water Act added strict rules in 1972, on industrial plants along waterways. But wind and rain sweeps much plastic into waterways from small collections of trash on beaches, roadsides, and parks. Perhaps for a while we weren't as bothered as we might have been, Charles Moore reasoned, because we still thought plastic material was inert and benign, an eyesore that couldn't do much harm. Now we know better. There's a picture of Charles Moore 
displaying items, including umbrella handles that had washed ashore on a beach in Hawaii. The trash came from the Pacific Gyre.